Welcome back to the Hard Brown Box News Corner for another weekly news wrap up of all the topics in the PC hardware space right now. We are in a bit of a lull period between major releases. We are expecting stuff to pick up again in a few months, but that of course means we're also heading into a period of silly rumors. So keep your eye out and brains engaged to sort the facts from the vast amounts of fiction that will be coming your way soon. First topic for this week is the official launch of the Intel Core i9-10850K, if you can call this official, because what actually happened is this chip was being leaked over the course of a few weeks. Outlets like Anantec reached out to see what the story was, and Intel confirmed the existence of this processor. Very strange series of events to debut a new entry in the lineup. Usually there is at least some form of press release, but in this case, the 10850K basically just appeared. And let's be honest, this is not the most exciting processor launch in the world. What we are looking at is a Core i9-10900K with 100 megahertz lower clock speeds across the board. So we're still getting 10 cores and 20 threads in an unlocked 14 nanometer design. But instead of a base frequency of 3.7 gigahertz, we're now looking at 3.6 gigahertz. The all core turbo drops from 4.9 to 4.8 gigahertz, and the maximum single core turbo drops from 5.3 to 5.2 gigahertz. Same 125 watt TDP. Given the clock speeds for the 10900K are already quite high, what this amounts to for the most part is a 2% reduction to frequency, which is not that significant of a change. However, what sounds like is happening here is that Intel have some Comet Lake silicon where all 10 cores are functioning, but clock speeds can't quite hit 5.3 or 4.9 gigahertz all core. So rather than locking that silicon down into a Core i9-10900 or a similar locked part that wouldn't sell very well, they are binning these chips into a 10850K that they can sell for a higher price and potentially in higher volume as well. Speaking of price, Intel has listed a tray price of $453 for the i9-10850K, that's US dollars of course, which is a $35 reduction on the $488 that the 10900K is listed as. It's also $19 less than the Core i9-10900KF's tray price, the KF model being the same as the 10900K but without an active iGPU. So this is a decent enough price reduction, but it's hard to say exactly where retail pricing will land given the 10900K's price has been extremely volatile since launch, almost always being either out of stock or well over $500. Maybe given the less stringent frequency requirements, the 10850K will be easy to produce and therefore cheaper, but yeah, we're just not sure. Either way, the 10850K isn't going to be a significant shakeup in the CPU market. We've already seen from our testing that if you want the fastest gaming CPU, you care all about those high frame rates and you won't compromise, then the Core i5-10600K is a much better path to go down than the 10-core CPUs, given how closely it performs to the 10900K while costing significantly less. Meanwhile, the Ryzen 9 3900X being priced below $450 at retail right now puts significant pressure on the Core i9 lineup and the introduction of another 10-core chip more expensive than it, well, doesn't really change that situation either. It will be interesting to see where prices stabilize for the Core i9 range and which parts end up becoming the most available over time, but right now I think Intel's lineup is a bit of a mess, not much availability, and I don't think the 10850K is gonna change all that much. I'm sure by now most of you will have heard about Intel delaying their 7 nanometer node, causing a huge shockwave through the industry. Intel's stock price has fallen drastically as a result, while companies like AMD and TSMC have risen. There's also talk recently of a class action lawsuit due to the situation. One of the more recent developments in this saga is the departure of Dr. Murthy Render Chintala, head of the Technology Systems Architecture and Client Group, or TSCG. Murthy has been an influential figure at Intel since he joined the company in 2015, with his group tasked with process node development. Effectively, he was, you know, has been overseeing the failures with 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer over the last five years, and will depart the company on August 3rd. Intel's official announcement on this change only makes a brief mention of Murthy's fate with a quote from CEO Bob Swan thanking Murthy for his leadership. While not confirmed by this statement, it does sound like Murthy has been pushed out or sacked by Intel's upper management as there is no mention of resignations or retirements. 
The TSCG is also being split into five new smaller groups effective immediately, which will report directly to the CEO as Intel seeks to address their process node failures. The Technology Development Group is the big new group here, headed by Dr. Ann Kelleher, which will be focused on developing next generation nodes like 7 and 5 nanometer. There's also the Manufacturing and Operations Group, tasked with overseeing Intel's fabs, the Architecture, Software and Graphics Group, that's headed by Raja Kaduri, the Supply Chain Division, which is fairly self-explanatory, and the new Design Engineering Team, which has an unclear role. So Intel is shaking things up a bit, hopefully to try and sort out some of their process node issues that they're having at the moment. Murthy seems to be a bit of a fall guy there for their problems, and yeah, we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. AMD delivered their quarterly earnings report this week, which is far more positive than Intel's, as you might expect given where each company's technologies currently sit. But I'm not going to dive into the numbers because I find that stuff super boring. What I am interested in are AMD's roadmaps and tidbits of information from their investor calls. As far as roadmaps are concerned, there isn't a lot to report, but that could be seen as a good thing. AMD are continuing to reiterate that Zen 3 will arrive on 7 nanometer later this year, as will RDNA 2 GPUs and the cDNA architecture. All three are listed for late 2020, so AMD's technology is on track. If there were going to be delays or changes to the roadmap, we usually hear about it at these investor briefings, so this is a pretty good sign. According to Anantech, AMD are saying that RDNA 2 will eventually be a full refresh of the company's GPU product stacks, and also that Zen 3 will make a debut on the desktop this year, clearing up the confusion as to whether AMD's statements around Zen 3 in 2020 are relating to server or client CPUs. We might only see limited or paper launches depending on how close AMD runs to their late 2020 statement, but AMD are sticking to their guns here. Other information out of the investor calls is that AMD are, as you would expect, shipping semi-custom SoCs to Sony and Microsoft for the next game consoles, and that's expected that it will increase AMD's quarter three earnings. Quarter four is where AMD are expecting to see the impact of Zen 3 and RDNA 2 on revenue. Lisa Su also mentioned that the supply situation with 7 nanometer remains tight at TSMC, although they are working hard to ensure they can meet demand, and Zen 4 was confirmed to be built on 5 nanometer as well. Naturally, there is a lot of excitement around AMD's next generation products, but it still sounds like we are at least a quarter away, if not longer, from hearing any concrete information. All the rumors right now point to, at least on the GPU side, Nvidia launching their next generation cards first and potentially a few months earlier than AMD. Speaking of Nvidia, the company has a new game bundle for buyers of GeForce RTX 20 series GPUs. The Frames Win Games bundle gives RTX buyers a copy of Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege Gold Edition, which includes the base game and all of its maps, plus a year five content pass. Part of the marketing around this bundle is highlighting that NVIDIA's entire GeForce 20 series is capable of playing the game at 144 FPS or higher, which gives gamers a competitive edge over those with slower, lower frame rate capable GPUs. Again, all the usual stuff applies for these bundles, so you'll have to buy a card from a participating retailer, and the program will last only through to August 27th. It also only applies to RTX 20 series cards from the RTX 2060 through to RTX 2080 Ti. Those interested in buying a GTX 16 series product while still perfectly capable of playing Rainbow Six Siege at high frame rates, they are being left out here. New Intel logos and branding have been spotted at the Justia Trademarks database by known Twitter leaker Momomo. It's unclear whether these logos will actually be used for anything, but they do represent a clear update to Intel's standard logos for their company and core series CPUs. For example, we have this new Intel Inside logo, as well as a flatter version of the Core logo, in this case for a Core i3. You'd think these would be used as stickers on OEM machines, as well as you know for various packaging and all that sort of thing. The most interesting logo of the bunch is the new Intel Evo powered by Core logo. Bit of a clumsy name there, um, but it also has i5 branding in the corner, and it's not clear what this is referring to. It does appear to be a new brand. Could it be for a next generation hybrid processor that mixes architectures? In any case, Intel have these logos and brands locked away for use, yeah, whenever they feel like it. In what is a bizarre move, ASRock has launched a new Radeon RX 5700 XT graphics card called the Challenger Pro 8G OC. For some reason, ASRock has felt that launching a new RX 5700 XT in the middle of 2020, right before next generation cards are set to launch, makes a whole ton of sense. 
Very strange thinking from ASRock and quite poor timing in my opinion. The card itself uses a triple fan 2.7 slot cooler and has a slight factory overclock of 2-3% with otherwise the same specs that we're used to seeing from RX 5700 XT graphics cards. This looks to be a higher end model that could command a higher than MSRP price tag, which again would be a little strange given card pricing will likely drop in the coming months in response to new GPUs. I guess one explanation here is ASRock had been working on this card for a while and couldn't wait any longer before releasing it otherwise they'd overlap with next gen cards. But anyway, we'll be interesting to see how well it sells. ASUS are set to launch the ROG Swift PG329Q in the coming months, which is particularly exciting as it brings a 32 inch 1440p IPS panel at 175Hz to the market. Larger IPS panels have been sorely lacking from the gaming monitor market, with VA being one of the only choices for high refresh panels if you wanted something 32 inches in size. Now it seems ASUS, along with Aces XB323U, are gunning for a new market segment that is short to attract attract IPS fans. The panel used here is said to have a 1 millisecond greater gray response time and features display HDR600 certification, 98% DCI-P3 gamut coverage and ELMB sync. We're likely seeing a new AU Optronics panel being used here. No word on pricing or release date just yet. Final topic for this week, Intel Rocket Lake CPUs have been allegedly spotted in the C-Software benchmark result database paired with the PCIe 4.0 SSD. This supports previous rumors suggesting Intel's next generation CPU platform while still expected to be built on 14 nanometer technology, will make the step up to PCIe 4.0. Motherboard makers have also been suggesting for a while now that PCIe 4.0 is coming to Intel's next-gen processors, possibly on Z490 boards themselves. There's no word on when Rocket Lake will launch, although going on Intel's current release cycle, you'd expect a late 2020 or early 2021 release. Some rumors have suggested these next-gen parts will use a new core architecture backboarded to 14 nanometer, but we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every week. We also have our Patreon page if you're interested in signing up, get access to our Discord chat, monthly live streams, and behind-the-scenes video. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.